Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone to Coffee and Viz and the first ever Black Research Symposium at NC State. Yeah. My name is Hannah and I'm a librarian here with NC State University Libraries. I am on the Coffee and Viz planning team. I am also honored to be a member of the Black Research Symposium planning team. So just a few logistics before we get started. This event is being live streamed. Hey. Um, and there will be a Q&A after the talk, so you could hold your questions until that time. So, and for those of you who are new to Coffee and Viz, this series began in 2015 and is a forum for researchers to share their work related to visualization. These programs are free and open to the public and provide, hopefully, provide a catalyst for collaboration across campus and in our community. So now it is my great honor to introduce Angela Gay Audrey to share more about the Black Research Symposium and introduce our speaker. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Hannah. It's such a beautiful thing. I met Hannah on my first day of grad school or maybe first week of grad school. She came to give a presentation about research for one of my courses. And now we work together on the regular and it's such a beautiful thing to witness. So, hey y'all, hey, good morning once again. I am Angela Gay Audrey, Director of the African American Cultural Center. And Hannah is absolutely right. You are witnessing history in the making. This is the first ever Black Research Symposium on historically a predominantly white campus, North Carolina State University. So yesterday I had the beautiful opportunity to watch us flow through an afternoon of scholarship, of brilliance, of indigenous knowledge, of knowledge that just comes from wisdom, from places of our hearts, from our desires, from pleasure, from just so many beautiful things. And this is largely thanks to our collaborators, our volunteers, presenters, and our financial partners. Everyone involved ensured that we had everything we needed it felt quite simply like an awakening, like a blessing. Thank you to all of you. Much like yesterday, I hope that everyone here today embraces the opportunity to dream, to innovate, and create the world as they know it should be, rather than it simply is. We don't have to accept the world as it simply is. Did you know, fun fact, that transforming the world was a Black technology Rooted in humanizing principles, it is a daily practice of building on the wisdom of our ancestors, learning and leaning into our own knowledges and ways of knowing and being accountable for every action that gives us futurity. As such, attending to the call Angela Davis gave us back in 2014 when she said, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world and you have to do it all the time. So yes, let's work together to augment reality, to immerse ourselves in ourselves, our histories, our communities, our communal desires to thrive. And let's do it starting now. With that, I have the distinct joy to introduce Dr. Derek Ham. Dr. Derek Ham is the Department Head of Media Arts Design and Technology in North Carolina State's College of Design. His research interest spans the areas of game-based learning, algorithm thinking, and digital fabrication and making. He is an award-winning designer with international recognition for his historic virtual reality explorations. In his work, he continues to investigate both virtual reality and augmented reality technology to find ways these tools can expand the possibilities of interactional design. Please join me in an invitation as we welcome Dr. Derek Ham. A warm welcome for his Coffee and Viz talk, World Building and Recovery, Revisiting Historical Moments with Virtual Reality. Dr. Ham, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, good morning, everyone. Today we're going to go on a little bit of a journey. Um, a journey to some of the places and spaces that you might think you know about, but maybe there's just a little bit of the story that you quite aren't familiar with. 
and the work that I've been doing for probably over the last seven years, you know, I was scratching the surface on some of these concepts before I even got my first VR headset um, way back when, for those who know immersive technology, we called it the DK1, the first Oculus um, back in 2013. But for a long time, I've been on this journey to see not just how this technology could unravel new worlds, transport us to the back of time, but how can it change the way we process and think about things? Um, everyone knows that, that phrase about, you know, history is written by those who are the victor. Everyone knows the concepts that there's a sense of power related to who gets to tell the narrative. So when I looked at virtual reality and from myself as someone in design and computation, I was really eager to say, let's start at the beginning. While this technology is fresh, while this technology is new, let's use this in a powerful and transformative way to help communicate some of the stories that might be lost or might be reduced to bullet points. My mom's a history teacher. And so I grew up, and I've told people, I grew up uh, in Virginia, and a lot of times I felt I was getting two history lessons, what I got in school and what mama told me. <laughs> And mom, as an educator and as someone who loved history, was always able to shed light on things and provoke me to think about things. And so even when I think about historical moments, a piece I did over here called I Am Man, a lot of people have talked about this piece. Um, this is the piece for me that was a pivotal moment for me in my career, really pushing the technology. I wanted to anchor that story because even as an adult, I had reduced that narrative down to bullet points. Dr. King, 1968, Lorraine Motel, assassin shot him, done. And what happens is when we reduce historical moments down to bullet points, we forget the human element of it. We forget things like the Memphis sanitation workers who were there fighting for equal pay. We forget about how his assassination disrupted lives, disrupted the cause, the sense of being hopeless, the sense of here we go again, another great leader shot. You know, when you start thinking about narratives in that way and anchor it down to the everyday person, it changes the way you reflect on it. It changes the perspective of it. And as myself, when I look at this the fact that we have an aging generation who live these things, who are now starting to pass away, I don't think all the time that we can rely on photos to really give you that sense of what it feel to be there. Photos are great, they capture the moment, it's a historical marker, but I figured that maybe we could start using these tools to bring the person reflecting on history to anchor and transport you there on the slowest pace to really get a sense of emotionally, physically, mentally, what it's like to be there. The work that I have been doing, I, I, I follow a very simple guideline and formula. And that's one, I begin with historical investigation. Most of the work that I've been doing in this space really starts with what's the raw material that we have. I think of it sometimes like being a paleontologist. It's like, what are the fragments of bones that we have? We're gonna build this dinosaur. Like, what do we have? Is it a few photographs? Is it a transcript? The piece I did uh, with the VMOK project, a big collaboration with our college of CHAS here, the College of Design Library, so many people came together to recreate Dr. King speaking at the White Rock Baptist Church, and we were truly looking for scraps. Three photographs of Dr. King, um, just a transcript, and a, and a few people who were there that night with their testimony. So it always starts with these scraps. What are these scraps? What are these pieces? And for me, I'm really drawn to the pieces that are, when you start to put them together, it's an aha moment. Whoa, I didn't know about that. Or there was a spin cue, or I think I knew, but not the full story. From a technical perspective, this historical investigation begins to transition where we do some translation. Again, if we have fragments, then how can we put these pieces together to make a whole picture, a more full picture? Sometimes these artifacts can be scanned. There are new techniques with photogrammetry. 
um, sometimes there's interpretation, using a photograph. In the case of Avatar, as you'll see a little bit later, really trying to model and craft. Um, sometimes it's as simple as looking in a catalog. When I did the I Am A Man piece, um, looking at the Lorraine Motel, Dr. King's room, being able to say, hmm, what's a telephone brand in, in eight, 1968? And just going through that. So it's fun, it's archival. You're pulling these things and you're creating these digital assets. But then when you put it all together, it's important to note, and you'll see this in, some, in this project I'm gonna sh share today, is that the overall experience is what we're trying to do with dissemination. And so while I've chosen VR, it's no different than someone who chose to create a book, someone to, who chose to create a website. You know, think of these things as a kit of parts. And now we're even expanding these things even more. So beyond just being a virtual reality experience, these things could be a performance. It could be a live performance. It could be a film. It could be an interactive game. And so it's really important for us to understand and expand this perspective that this type of work, this type of creating these experiences are not locked into one output. And we can do a lot of amazing magical things of pulling them out of the headset. You saw an image here and you've seen it a couple of times, you'll see it reoccurring, the idea of the hand, the hand interacting. And for those who've never used VR, there is something that is about this technology that makes it unique to any other form of media. And that is the fact that the user's hands are tracked in the headset to give you a sense of presence through the interaction and also the visual representation of the body. Now, what if we can flip it? And so instead of it being your hands with a snap, we can give you the hands of someone else. You see, that's for me, the magic of virtual reality, to be able to put you in the body of someone else, to be able to look down and say, that's not more for me, I'm a black man. So it's like, those are my hands. But for some of you, you're like, my gender has changed or my ethnicity has changed. And that you can't escape throughout the whole VR piece. You see, when I watch a documentary, when you watch a film, when I watch something um, as cringing as Schindler's List, there's still a distance. I can look away, I can say, oh, that's hard to swallow, and I feel safe in my living room and my space. But something about virtual reality puts you in there and you can't escape your new assigned identity. With that comes a strong responsibility for the developer to make sure that we are scaffolding these moments to you at a pace that you can take. It's a lot different to watch something that was horrific on a screen versus living it out and being in the space. The closest thing that comes to it is when I saw the making of um, 12 Years a Slave. And some of the set members were talking about how hard it was just to be on a set to see these things reenacted. For me, as a scholar, as someone looking to tell these mediums this new story, I take that responsibility very, very heavy. And oftentimes, we don't go there as developers. We pause. We pull back. In the case of the uh, I Am A Man piece, you're standing at the Lorraine Motel. You know Dr. King is standing right there. If you know your history, you know it's about to happen. And instead of showing you this full graphic, him being shot in front of your face, fade to black and you hear the shot in the distance. I truly believe that with this comes this responsibility to say, I want you to feel something, but I still have to use a sense of control and moderation to make sure that we're not glorifying these moments that I want you to feel and process. That type of processing and feeling relates to something that Sherry Turkle calls embodied identity. You see, she talks about that there is something about interacting with objects, she calls them evocative objects, that really allows us to anchor into a place of memory. You know, think about finding maybe a box in the back of your closet of an old toy or an old object. Could be yours, could be of a family member. For me, I have three little children, and every now and then when I'm cleaning up, I'll find some toy that they're just too cool to play with now. But it'll be like, oh, that was that thing. That was that stuffed animal. And I hold it and I'm instantly taken back to when they were that age. There is something about interacting with objects 
And the type of embodied identity for me, giving you the agency to interact with physical digital things is still a touch forward to enable you to connect with place and space. All of these things connect to what uh, Chris Milk called VR being the ultimate empathy machine. And as you see here, I don't use the word machine, I use the word tool. Oftentimes when we use the word machine, we think it's automatic. Hey, I felt a certain type of way towards a certain demographic. I put a VR headset on, it changed my life and I'm no longer a bigot. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. VR is a tool. Immersive technology is a tool, which implies you have to do some work. You have to be willing to be open for your mind to be changed, to be when this new perspective is shared before you, putting on a headset, if you are willing to, will enable you to reflect and think differently about a specific moment in time, not from your perspective in time, about their perspective in time at that place in space. I've also, before I go here, I've also been thinking about this word empathy. What do you think of when you think of the word empathy? We think of feelings, we think of sharing one's feelings. But when I start scratching the surface, I was like, but what feelings? You see, it's easy to think about empathy from the lens of sharing someone's grief and pain. But that is not the definition of empathy. Empathy is sharing and feeling someone's emotions. And that's when it dawned on me. Well, why should I want people just to feel black sorrow? <laughs> Can you feel some joy? Can you feel a little bit of the triumph? Can you feel a little bit of the swag? <laughs> That's what I started to think and from myself, even as a developer, making these VR experiences, it weighed on me doing VM okay, I am a man. In between that, those projects, I was also consulted to do a piece with VR and policing. I'll save that story for another day. That's weighty. And I started thinking of like, I can still talk about empathy, but it doesn't always have to be pain. And that's when I started to think about the joy, the triumph, the success, swag, everything that we see in today's modern sports era, NFL, NBA, and even the MLB, these guys invented it. That's Negro League Baseball. If you ever get a chance and you're ever in Kansas City, visit the Negro League Baseball Museum. If you're ever in Memphis, visit the um, National Civil Rights Museum. I partnered with both for each of these projects. For I'm a Man, my, pro my partners were the National Civil Rights Museum. And for Barnstormers, I partnered with the Negro League Baseball Museum. It was so refreshing to go to that museum in Kansas City, talking with their director, Bob Kendrick, and I laughed. I truly laughed. Can you think about it for a moment? I went through Black history and I laughed. I went through Black history and I clapped my hands and I felt empowered. Oftentimes, we don't get to see those moments in time. So the history of Negro League Baseball is very complex because while these men were not allowed to be on the field of Major League Baseball players, they made the most out of it. And when I said made the most out of it, they had a blast. Here's a trailer of Barnstormers. When I started thinking about doing this story, I for my personally felt motivated that I could grab a subject matter that had that still that moment of struggle, but had a whole other side of it. That's about triumph. That's about joy. That's about brotherhood, camaraderie. It's a very complex thing. You see, when we start trying to unravel the American narrative easily to say, this is villains. These are heroes. This was good. This was bad. 
even if you think about the amount of wealth that was captured within the black community because of Negro League Baseball, black owners of teams, women owners, black women owners of baseball teams, players who were traveling to Cuba and the US making wealth. You see, part of the narrative, it's easy to reduce the story and say, oh, we feel so sorry for them. And then, yay, Major League Baseball opened their doors with Jackie Robinson. But you have to realize, and you get this part of the narrative at the museum, with the integration of these players to Major League, it was a blessing and a curse. There was money loss. These ballparks began to close. As a matter of fact, today, there's only six stadiums that these Negro League players played on. And so while Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth and all their stories and history gets to live on forever, these guys, their stories begin to fade away. So I said, huh, maybe we can use immersive technology instead of letting it fade away, fade it back to color. That's just a taste of what it's like to do Barnstormers. If you really want the full experience, I would encourage you uh, to go over to uh, the VR laboratory over in, in DH Hill and Colin's shaking his head. It's just been released on the Steam, the VR engine. So it's being more broadly disseminated now. But that's just a taste of what it's like to be on the big stage of these guys. You see, let's start over here. Everyone knows this guy, household name. Jackie Robinson, first Negro League player. And I should even roll that back. Not many people even know that he had a full season with the Kansas City Monarchs. First player, he made it into the majors. It would have been too easy to just say, let's tell another Jackie Robinson story. Let's talk about the first player. I bet very few of you knew that in the same year Jackie Robinson entered into Major League Baseball, in the same year, two months later, Larry Doby. We all know Jackie, no one knows Larry. That is a problem. That is a problem that I call reducing history to bullet points. It's so simple just to say, give me the first, give me the easy narrative. Let's not talk about the complexity. Let's not talk about the wealth that they were generating in Negro League. Let's not talk about the success. It was only recently that the Major League Baseball decided to bring all of their stats over and account them as legitimate athletic stats. It wasn't even that much long ago before they had to fight to get them into the Hall of Fame. Some of the players that never transitioned over Roy Campanella transitioned over. Satchel Page was out of his prime before he came over, but he was still torching them. He was still throwing them. Josh Gibson unfortunately passed away before his time was come. And Josh Gibson arguably was completely a better player than Jackie. But Jackie had some other components and elements to his life that made him better to be the first. As they told me at the museum, you see, when they swore at Jackie, Jackie had the composure to take it. Josh would have hit him with a bat. <laughs> so there's so much beauty and story in the narratives between these players. And I would even say over here, North Carolina's own Buck Leonard out of Rocky Mount, North Carolina. 
an amazing ball player. They called him baseball's gentleman just because of how much people enjoyed and liked to be around him. These were the names that I wanted to resurrect because again, these are the names that are only lost to either historians of the game or, his, or just his, historians in general. But we don't have these names, Josh Gibson, Dobie, Page. These are names that should have been in the names and the lore of everyone else, just as we talk about Babe Ruth, Ty Cobb. So as a storyteller, and I'll talk a little bit about my craft of storytelling for a little bit, I wanted to anchor this story and start in a simple streets. The city didn't matter to me. I didn't focus on Chicago or New York. I wanted to focus you on the concept of Sandlot baseball, of kids, black kids, the diversity of color in the black community playing this game. If anyone's ever seen the movie Sandlot, it's one of my favorite sport movies. It's that, that love, the kids playing and enjoying themselves. I wanted to start the narrative there and capture that. For me, technically working with this, I was able to get a partner, um, two, two tech partners uh, endorsed this project, one being Epic Games through their mega grant, and the second one being an, an upcoming company called Real Illusion that focuses on avatar building. And, and so for me, <laughs> these are my kids. These are my nephews. These are my little cousins. These are my cousin's kids. This is the representation, frankly, I don't even see often in digital media production and some of the projects that I produce. But I want to take you there. I wanted to bring you there to the streets and even begin the narrative early on of children just playing. I transitioned this as a starting point over to tryout fields. This is where the fun takes place. This is where you hear laughter in the background. This is where the guys are cutting up as well as practicing and playing. They're giants of the field. They're masters of their craft. They're bringing a fraternity, a brotherhood. How could I give you a sense of that? How could I give you a feeling of that? You on the field practicing. You saw some of the clips would have liked to be in some of the historic spaces and places. But I even touched slightly on the night culture. The idea that you play hard on the field, you can play hard off the field. But ironically, the places where they were playing off the field, those doors were closed to them. So they were going to places like Ninth and Vine. They were going to places that you could find on the green book, hotels to stay in, nightclubs to visit. When you think about building these types of projects, I will disclose that every stadium in Barnstormers is not a complete historical recreation but I did find the opportunity to dig into one, and that's Muleback Stadium out of Kansas City. Working with some of my graduate students, you know, I have a background in architecture, so I still have a strong affinity of trying to dig into some blueprints and build some spaces, but working with one of my graduate students, we found one stadium that we felt was strong and iconic to the narrative I was trying to tell, and that's Muleback Stadium. Finding the blueprints, uh, looking at photographs, trying to get an understanding of how many people did the stadium actually hold? What was the configuration? What was special about this? And so that was a great part of the process for me because I did that painstakingly in I'm a Man. I built the Lorraine Motel room 306 perfectly, bedspread, phones and everything. And so for me, there's that part of the historical telling, trying to anchor it with some these doses of, this is as accurate as we can get. And then other parts, you have to take creative liberty. You have to expand that. Other parts of the project that I thought was really interesting from a technical perspective is how do we deal with these old school baseball players? You see, for those who develop these types of projects, it's easy now to go into what we call motion capture libraries. And there are a ton for sports. There's some, they have them for basketball, football, baseball. These are the types of motion files that get recycled a lot of time in various projects. But I simply couldn't take a typical picture motion capture file and, and slap it on the great satchel page. This is where we start to look into some of the contemporary tools that are out now today. And it started with the video footage. 
step one was seeing what could contemporary AI tools do that could analyze that video and apply those motions to what we call a skeletal rig. And that's what it did. First, taking the video footage, cleaning it up. As you see, old video footage has a lot of speckles and flickers, and that does impact the way we process this type of footage. But then after that, taking that footage and putting it through the pipeline and then throwing it on what a picture would look like, even with less detail than this, basically a skeleton, lines and polygons, the data telling it where the arm would swing, where it would move. Unfortunately, at the time this was built, the AI tools were still not good enough to fully drag it over. So a lot of cleanup had to be done. These were, you know, Satchel was throwing it and he was twitching a little bit because the, the, the data wasn't going through. So it had to do a lot of cleanup. If I was to do this project today and I keep these tools, I'm, I'm always investigating them, I'm convinced it, it can be even smoother. And for you in the audience who are like, this is great. I think I have a story I want to tell. I'm telling you, these tools are becoming more and more accessible for you to do this type of transformable research, taking an old motion video, applying it to an avatar, even to the point now where some of the 3D modeling, which we did, could be kickstarted by AI systems to read photographs, to reconstruct models. But for me, the process did use a, a, a collection of various tools, applying it to a 3D modeled avatar, and then beginning to test these things. Now, as a VR developer, we think of these stories as easy access, but the ch most challenging thing was, well, how fast should Satchel's ball be? I mean, in reality, if we any of us stepped up to bat, he would have striked us all out. He was striking out people like Josh Gibson. So we did have to take a little bit of liberty. I slowed his fastball down just a little bit to allow some people to hit. As I mentioned before, uh, it was 2020. At the same time I was working on this project, I got a great email from uh, the director of the museum. He's like, did you see this news? And I, and I popped it open and they did it. The Negro League Baseball styled the stats of seven professional players between 1920 to 48. And that began to open the floodgates. More and more players were being confirmed that their stats are legitimate stats for home runs, for um, runs to base, for strikeouts. And they should have been. They should have been all along because there was no thing, nothing that said that this league was any inferior to the league that was happening in the majors. If anything, people could say this one was a little bit better. Last fall, for me, a pivotal moment in understanding the future of these types of projects came when Josh Gibson's great grandson, Sean, after through several phone conversations, said he wanted to come down at NC State and see the project up front. I did get his blessing doing this. I'm rocking my Gibson t-shirt here today, the grays. Um, doing this project, I took extra effort to try to reach out to as many of the families as I could. Gibson family was one. Um, Buck Leonard and Rocky Mount. And one of the things I told them and promised them that they would forever have access to the file. I said, this FBX file, and I know you don't know what an FBX file is, but it belongs to you. You can use it. It's your, your great grandfather. It's your family member. You see, part of the problem is that Getty Images has been holding these photographs hostage for years from these families having to pay fees to use the photo of your own grandfather just doesn't seem right. And so I knew doing this project, this would always be open access to them. If you want the 3D model, if you want the file, do whatever you want with it. Buck Leonard, they did a rendering of one of the, the avatars and they had it on a t-shirt and I was like, right on. Um, this is a challenging thing for everyone who works with digital humanities and history knows that challenge with photographs and rights. And so there was something about this that I felt was restorative, that we could make these assets and you can have them. You could do whatever you want. You can tell the stories that you want. 
I mentioned some of the, the technology that was used, but an important aspect came when Sean was able to provide voiceover and facial animation data that we could apply for future renditions of Josh Gibson. It was an emotional period for me to see this. It was emotional for him to sit there and reflect on this. I remember he came down to my lab that you see pictured here and he says like, I'm ready for this. And he gets there and he's like pauses because he's looking right at his grandfather. And then he starts to talk as some and it's mirrored and matched for, this is the first time I've ever explored this, and I think this is just the, the tip of the iceberg for us to use these types of technologies in transformable ways, in ways that reconnect people, reconnect communities, even sometimes with their ancestors. When I, I'm, we're about to go to questions and answers, but I'll talk about this briefly. When I, and I teach this in my classroom, when we do these types of projects, that are so meaningful to communities that have such educational value, we cannot afford to make these be the worst aesthetic projects. For a long time, digital humanities and educational products have gotten the kind of pass. Oh, why does it look so bad? Oh, it's educational. And I think that's a problem, especially if you make it educational and then you're dealing with underrepresented communities. No one really wants to admit the elephant in the room is, why does it look so bad? And so for me, every project that I've done, I've carved out the necessary time to make sure visually, aesthetically, functionally, that it met a high bar quality. So for me, my dissemination metrics, it's not just being at a conference and being, at a being in a journal or talking about it. That's important too. I sent it out to commercial film festivals. And in those festivals with anticipation as I wait on my email to see if it's gonna get accepted or not. This was the verification for me to make sure that the work was being kept at a high quality. And I feel very thankful and grateful that it was received very well um, in a large national and international community, the big one being at the Cannes Film Festival last summer. This is Barnstormers, this is my work. This is my passion as I continue to tell these stories I'm happy to see the technology is becoming more and more accessible, but ultimately it still relies on the storytellers and empowering them. You see, I understand there's a day coming where a photograph might be able to pump that out. But then if that happens, how can we then make sure that we're holding to our responsibility to put this in the hands of the communities who want to tell that story? Everyone wants to bash AI that says, oh, it's doing this to the industry. I see the promise of it. I see the accessibility to allow communities such as Negro League Baseball to tell their story to the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ham. So we have plenty of time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring you the microphone. That was an awesome talk. Thank you, Dr. Ham. The sports game genre has been one of the most stagnant over the last 30 years or so. There hasn't been much innovation in sports games. Does working in types of media that haven't changed or aren't changing at the same rate uh, inspire you or do you see opportunities there? Yeah, you know, it's a challenging thing here because, you know, ultimately my original pitch when I sent it to um, the Epic Games for their mega grant it was much larger than what I had submitted here. It was story plus unlockable gameplay, like doing both. Now, I love the Negro League Baseball Museum um, because while I was working with Bob Kedrick, the director for this, his wheels were turning in the background. He solved the other side of the equation. All of these players were recently, not all of them, many of them were recently added as story packs for MLB The Show which is a very popular game on PlayStation and consoles. And when I saw that, well, first I was like, what, how, how did that happen? But then I saw, I was like, Negro League Baseball Museum. I was like, oh, great. So I was like, Bob, he's doing it. He's like, oh, okay. Got that VR project over there, that's good. Here's another thing. And so 
actually that kind of released me personally. I was like, oh, well, I don't really need to add the whole VR experience to a full playable like MLB the show. You can play MLB the show and do it. So it's like a kid of parts. Um, I am inspired though by more narrative base embedding and gameplay, but you're gonna need a much larger team to achieve that. It's very hard to, so most of the products I see, you either have gameplay done or you have rich narrative. It's really hard to bridge it. You almost need two divisions to think about that. And so, you know, at any time, the great thing about building digital content, while it's not locked like a documentary, the end of the date's cut, you can always go back in there and expand it and pull it apart. So with the Buck Leonard Association and with the Gibson Association, we've pulled the avatar out of the VR project and just created simple AR applications. And I get posts from Buck Leonard Association, they'll be on a field with a bunch of kids doing their typical things. And it's like, kids, I'll take a picture. And there's Buck standing there with the kids. Like that for them, that's fantastic. And so that's why I'm really interested in like pulling it out more than just VR to all these different components. But you're right about the gameplay genre. You know, you look at games where um, you're boxing, for instance, and I'm like, well, why isn't there a full Muhammad Ali narrative embedded in a boxing experience? Or those genres are really hard to do. But it's about storytelling at the end of the day. Like people want to slow themselves down. People are looking for great stories. And, that, and the great thing about all these narratives when you start getting into the history and like, you can't make this stuff up. Some of the antics, I only touch the tip of the iceberg to introduce you to the world of Negro League Baseball. Satchel Paige could have a four season HBO, um, not even documentary, a, a, a biopic. Like these guys had amazing stories. So I do think the promise is there, but it's going back to like, let's return to storytelling. Um, and, I'll, and I'll touch on one last thing related to storytelling. In our classes, we're talking a lot about human storytelling and, and breaking that down to the exchange from human to another. And, and in this time of AI and chat GPT, it's really important to specify the different types of stories. I'm all for the amusement of allowing chat GPT to pump out a narrative. Very amusing. It's a thing. It's a thing. But there's a difference when a human being tells me the story because I know their wills are spinning. They're, they're putting it together. They're, they're compositing it for me. And it's a gift exchange. I've never gotten that gift exchange from anything I've read or, or visually seen from an AI tool. It's just a different product. And we have to specify, we, it's, we're gonna live in a world of those two different products. We do it with food all the time. <laughs> mass produced food versus sitting down and going to a restaurant where there's a chef in the back that's like, this is what we designed for tonight and only tonight, and we put this thing together. So I think storytelling is the same way. We'll have ChatGPT making up narratives and wacky stories, but then we'll have like, let me tell you a story. Even if it's fiction, let me sit and craft a story for this audience. And that's a completely different thing. And that's why I love about history because it's there, it's written, it's lived. And there's like a body to it that an AI quick story just doesn't have. Good morning. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, this project makes my heart so happy. I'm not a gamer myself, but my brothers are. Um, and just the fact that they're like, this now exists for them to be able to learn more about our history. It just, it just, it makes me so happy. Um, so I was wondering how long does a, pro a project like this take? And um, especially when you're being so authentic and so true to the narrative and, and um, being ethical in the way that you are going um, about the process and do you foresee AI being able to make this process quicker or are there certain challenges um, that are presented when trying to create an authentic project such as this? Yeah, that's a great question. So most of my projects will range between 14 months to, I mean, a year and two months to a year and a half. That's usually about the range of the development timeline for a piece like this. Um, I mean, I don't know if I account for 
like the things you build in your head lead up. I'm like working on projects right now in my head or, of leading up. So you don't really account for that time. Um, but th so that's usually the range of development time. And it depends upon how pro large of a project, you know, I use different tools that can help with the production pipeline. Um, pipeline. Um, I'm a big fan of not just researching history, researching tools and assets that can help with that. Um, I remember when I did the scene in Barnstormers and I want to anchor it um, in the 1940s and I needed some vehicles, there's scenes where vehicles are coming back. Um, I didn't realize um, that you had to even get more permissions to use them. So I was able to get find a developer who made these vehicles for props for games and stuff. But then even with that, I had to then send another verification because they had a blessing from Ford. And so it had like a double acceptance, like, yes, you can use your, we, you pay for it for commercial value, but then you say, well, what are you using it for? And you do that. And then someone at Ford was like, yeah, cool. So it's like a trickle down thing. So I, I, I never knew that until this project. And I saw like, oh, that's, that's, that's really interesting that the legitimacy of a, of a 3D model being connected that way. Um, AI tools, simplifying things in the future, absolutely. Some of the coding and programming that's in the background. Um, I'm a man, it's, it's simple. You're picking up things, simple in the programming, what I'm saying. Oh, you pick up a thing, you put it down, things have simple mechanics. And then I jumped to baseball. I'm like, ah, why did I do this? All right, let's break down. And like, I have sketchbooks of like thinking through the, the, the programming system of like, triggering that and this happens here and catching and what happens if this happens there's, there's so many more variables to account for and then having to create you know scripting code to allow this to happen that's where i think the ai tools would help assist in kind of like coding with you or thinking through systems to make these things happen faster i mentioned a little bit about like video analysis and photo analysis those tools being more improved so that if you use that footage it can be snapped onto an avatar um, I will say this, and I looked, we don't know yet if you transfer footage from video over to an avatar, do you still owe Getty? It's a, it's a weird loophole right now because it's like no one has done it. Um, you've seen some of these old, those footages where you have the black and white um, photo and they like make the head turn. They like do like silly songs and stuff. No one knows yet. If you take that photo, you feed it through the system, and the head turns, it's a new photo. So there's a lot of everyone's like kind of scrambling. Some of the big owners of some of these things are scrambling to figure out the legality of, well, if you started the project with that footage, do you owe them this and that? There's a lot of unknown things there, but I'm always looking for those new pipelines to make that happen. So I do think AI will cut down some of the programming, some of the logistics, some of the modeling, some of the animation potentially for a project like that. I think that's, that, that'd be great because it gives you more time to then flush out more story details, put more things in it and, and continue to like work with the communities that you want to build these things for. No. Um, and that's where the Epic Games mega grant came in for me to be able to, to purchase necessary tools I needed to. I will say with Real Illusion, part of their grant towards it was both um, money to develop as well as a suite of their tools. And so that came in hand. So um, the Unreal Game Engine, however, that is open source-ish, right? So um, it's open source in the sense that you can download it for free and build it. If you make a project for free, you release it. Barnstormers was part of a commercial endeavor too. So on Steam, it's being sold. When it reaches a certain threshold, I still think it's, I don't know, $100,000 or something really high. That's when you start paying your royalties back to them for their engine. I'd be happy to see if it ever <laughs> Yeah. Hi. Um, you taught briefly about the nightlife of the ballplayers. Yeah. And I was wondering when you were doing your research, if you came across any stories about the relationship between the ballplayers and musicians at the time. Uh, um, I feel like there's always a special bond. They tour around the country, the masters of their craft. And at that time, especially like black musicians being able to tour around. Um, 
probably related closely. That relationship, I wanted to bring in just a cast of cameos into that club. I had this vision of just like the best jazz players and musicians at that time. That project, I just couldn't get that there. But the relationship, you're right, is there. So um, if you go to the museum in Kansas City, they actually have a jazz museum sharing the building with the Negro League Baseball Museum. You come to a front entrance and on one side, it's a whole museum, the music side of history, other side is Negro League Baseball. That was done intentionally because the location, the distance between those two communities, going to uh, see a game or going to the club the night before, like a Saturday night, sometimes the games are played late on Sunday. Those relationships were built. I only brought you into one of those spaces um, to give you this spatial representation and, and feel like this was part of the narrative. Um, but no, I didn't bring like the actual, any, any historical people in that space. Um, you should definitely, it's like, I wanted to say some, I, some of the things are like, I talk about it, but the other things is like, I want you to be caught off guard and try the experience yourself. So I definitely I encourage you to go and, and try it over in our VR. Um, part of the library. Yeah, so this might actually build a little bit into that. Um, but since kind of beginning this work and seeing all the different kind of possibilities, all these different directions that you could go with it, um, do you have kind of like a a, a dream project that, that you'd love to work on or, or anything kind of coming down the pipeline that you're especially excited about? I do, and I can't talk about it right now. <laughs> I'm actively working on um two projects one was a project that i had known about and i'm exploring different ways it will be actually delivered that's a project um that is looking it, it's actually more fictional based the history actually is about the people who actually made the content the, the books themselves it was, a, it was a father son duo um the father was an illustrator the son was an um a storyteller they made a series of books got on Sesame Street, it was about Harlem. It was very black community driven. They've passed away and I've had a relationship with their family. So I've been wanting to do something with their IP. So that's something that works. So that's been a long time coming. It might have some VR in it, might, might some animation. There's a lot of stuff with that. But then there's another one that it's like, oh, that's the one that's like speaks directly into me. All I can say is, yes, it's history again. Um, it's playful and, um, that's all I really want to tease about it, but it it's it's in the pipeline, and I, and it, that's the one that when I'm tired at the end of the day, I'll actually start writing and working on that because that's how much joy it gives me. And I think I tell my students that's the type of work you want to do, the work that's like even when you're tired, you want to start crafting and working on it. Like those are those are the projects. So so yes and yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, great. What are, what are some things that your students are working on that are inspiring you? That's a, that's a, you know, our students in our program do a range of different things. And um, sometimes what students will do will just work on a technical aspect that could expand storytelling. So um, because this is, I knew this wasn't like a tech or game maker crowd, I left off some parts of the making. Um, there's a whole section that I talk about of making paper feel like paper. And so the difference between like holding a newspaper and I am a man, and if you ever get a chance to look at both projects, I would say, pick up the newspaper, please pick up the newspaper. Because then I'm a man, it's like a rigid board, it's a newspaper, it is. And I spend weeks for a simple detail to pick up a poster. You see it in the trailer, it's intentional. I was like, that thing flaps, it makes the noise. When you throw it up, it's like, woo. It's like, it is as paper as you can get without the crumpling it turned to a ball. You can't do that, but like, that's a technical thing. So I have a student right now working on knot time. It's like, oh, that's a really complex thing to do in VR. Holding two pieces of string or two rope and how would you turn it into a knot in the physics and the interaction? And so he's just working on that right now. But like, once that happens, I'm like, whoa, nautical stories and military experiences and tying things down. Like sometimes it's a, it's a one interaction of UX that can drive a whole thing. With Barnstormers, it was 
baseball. For me, I had this and I wanted to feel hitting a ball was one of the first mechanics I started playing with to let my imagination go. So sometimes that's all it takes. And then you can build off of that. It can come from a photo. It can come from a UX experience. It can come from any of those things. So I'm really ex excited about his name is Austin Kasky. Um, I'm really excited about his not tying um, master's thesis right now in VR. <laughs> So I have a question. What other opportunities do you see for students at NC State to get into new technologies? Is it strictly in the College of Design or have you seen ways other curriculums can start to integrate technologies so students can be at the forefront of technologies? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I, the College of Design has a wonderful relationship with chess. Um, when we did the uh, VMOK project, uh, Dr. Victor, Victoria Gallagher, who's over there in rhetoric, like she led the way and we were co-PIs on that. Um, that relationship is there. So if you're in one of those two colleges, that's a natural, we built that bridge. I would even say even in CS, um, we've started to build better bridges. I have a colleague, um, Dr. Arnav Jala, we've worked on some things. And so those are disciplines that we have that are, are, are connected. I think beyond that, um, I'm here at NC State. I think there's ways that we can explore. I think some of the workshops that Colin has done in the library with hackathons and have proven to be successful to bring people together. Um, it's, it's really a demand thing. And I'm like, I would love to see us say, oh, let's do a sprint <laughs> weekend humanities, digital exploration in the College of Design, come one, come all, supported by different people. Like with some of these tools, you can whip out some very quick prototypes. And then after that, it's a matter of the dedication of a team to do more, to do that type of stuff. So it's really a question about building these relationships, reaching out, having the conversations, and then seeing, well, how would they, they manifest themselves out? Periodically in the design school, we do have courses and workshops where students can come in, but I would love to see something broader, more meaningful um, built like that. It's just a matter of coming together, planning, and looking at those, those types of opportunities. There's probably time for a quick question, if anyone else has one. If not, thank you so much, Dr. Ham. Very in informative. Um, yeah, thank you all for joining us. Uh, help yourself to coffee and snacks and the fishbowl. And if you're here for the Black Research Symposium, 